one of the mixed blessings of technology is that you can like abstract your way yourself away from suffering and try to help others in a way that doesn't involve you like getting involved in their lives or like being in relationship with them. And that's just not the way that human beings are supposed to be. Hi, friends. I'm Amy Julia Becker, and this is Love is Stronger Than Fear, a podcast about pursuing hope and healing in the midst of personal pain and social division. I'm here today with Dr. Matthew Loftus. Matthew is a medical doctor, a teacher, and a missionary serving in Kenya, and you're going to get to hear all about how those different roles uh, work together in his life and in his community. He writes a lot about medicine and about faith and ethics, and that's how I was introduced to him, and I was really grateful to read his thoughts as they pertain to COVID-19, as they pertain to how we understand our bodies in the context of communities, um, all, all sorts of really, really good stuff in his essays, which we will link to in the show notes for this uh, conversation. And I'm really glad that I get to share with you some of his thoughts about the limits of medicine, the role of medicine, um, all of these things when it comes to healing and to wholeness. Matthew, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today from far, far away. It's really great to have you. It's, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor. So I want to actually begin because I am seeing you on Zoom, but our listeners are not. And I want to begin by way of introduction. <laughs> Could you just, sure. um, yes, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are, who you are, um, but I, I mean, where you are specifically right now. Could you could you just narrate that for a minute? Sure. Uh, I am in my living room under a blanket in case uh, the phone rings or um, my kids wake up. I am in Kenya. In rural Kenya, it's a town called Latane, uh, a very busy little town in an otherwise very rural area. So we have, uh, I work at a hospital here up at the top of a hill and uh, the town itself has, you know, bank, two gas stations, grocery stores, etc. And then you drive in any direction and it's just beautiful farms and tea fields for miles and miles and miles. Mm. Um yeah, so uh, that's where I am calling in from today. So tell us a little bit about how you got to this hospital in rural but kind of populated <laughs> Kenya um, and, you know, what day-to-day life looks like for you. Yeah, so uh, our family, our story uh, started off uh, overseas in South Sudan. Uh, we started working at a hospital there. At the end of 2015, we were only there for a year. We had to evacuate because of uh, the civil war um, that reached there. Um, so we spent a little bit of time wandering around, and I connected with this particular hospital in Latain uh, because it's part of a um, larger network of hospitals that's training family medicine residents. So doing postgraduate training for doctors. Mm. Um, so that is my official job title um, is program coordinator for um, these residents. So I train doctors how to become family physicians um, with some of my time. Um, And then I also spend a lot of time just seeing patients and then teaching other health professionals in the hospital. Um, And yeah, we, we came to this particular hospital because um, they were, it's a, completely Kenyan run institution. Hmm. Uh, We were the first missionaries here in about 15 years when we arrived in 2018. And um, we've been here for four years now. Um, Right now, uh, there aren't any other American missionary families. It's just us. And it's really cool being part of an institution that's totally African run. Um, You know, I don't have to make a lot of big decisions except when, you know, they want my opinion. (laughs) And I get to be involved in teaching and training people who are really passionate about um, caring for others, uh, you know, learning, growing in their skills um, and uh, growing in their faith. So it sounds like you're wearing, well, maybe you don't see these as two hats. Maybe it's one hat, but they're two, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, brims. (laughs) 
<laughs> a terrible analogy. <laughs> but I'm thinking yeah. about both your role as kind of doctor, teacher, and the word missionary, right? So can you yes. just mm-hmm. like speak to people who don't maybe have a vision of missionary that came from like um, – Prodigal Summer was that Barbara Kingsolver's book? Is that is that was that the right one? It wasn't Prodigal Summer. The uh, no, Poisonwood was, um, Bible. Poisonwood Poison Bible. Bible. Yes, 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 yes. Like people who have no, that in their yes, mind when they yes. think about missionary in Africa. Like, can you mm-hmm. speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's a little bit different than Poisonwood Bible. I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, no, no pith helmets involved. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously there's lots of different ways that people can be missionaries in the world. Today, there are people who, you know, sit behind computers in the U.S. and they, you know, generate um, online content for people in closed countries to engage with on Facebook, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then, you know, there's people who are uh, you know, trying to directly work with uh, people that have uh, never heard of Jesus, never heard um, the gospel before. Uh, and then there's all kinds of things in between. So for us, uh, we work at a mission hospital. It was started uh, nearly 100 years ago um, by missionaries who did actually wear pith helmets. I actually I have a picture of one of them treating a guy with a leopard bite. Um Wow. In my, uh, that we use in our presentations, um, (laughs) things are a little different. So, you know, nowadays I'm, you know, trying to help people who, uh, you know, have the same, you know, diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and all those other things, trying to train a new workforce, um, to deal with chronic diseases, um, and depression and anxiety and, bipolar disorder and things like that. And I think my role as a missionary is is trying to encourage and equip Christians um, who want to serve, but um, maybe they don't, you know, have a vision or the skills to apply their faith. Hmm. Um, You know, and and, uh, something that's very universal, I think, in, in medicine is that there's the constant temptation, just the busyness, the stress, um, the system itself that's not really designed to care for people so much as it is to, you know, kind of fix what problems that can be fixed and make money off the problems that can't be fixed either. Mm. Um, and so, uh, I think a lot of what I try to do for doctors and other health professionals is really to encourage them that their faith can connect with, um, what they do, um, in a day-to-day basis, because it's really hard to, or it's, I should say, it's really easy to be discouraged. Um, It's really easy to just sort of get sucked into the system, to get jaded, um, you know, to let the secondary trauma of watching people die, watching people suffer, Mm -hmm. um, and watching yourself be unable necessarily to help people, um, to get to people. Um, And so a lot of what I'm doing is just trying to uh, encourage people to find a way to keep their hope and love alive in what they do. Um, and then also try to have leaders who, you know, kind of train up leaders who can help to make the healthcare system better and then go out to places that are even harder for like Western missionaries to reach. So, um, yeah, there's, there's places all across East Africa, um, where it's just easier to go, um, whether because of, hostility, um, from, you know, in war situations or, um, you know, other religions or things like that, um, where I think, uh, there's a lot of African health professionals that want to go and serve and help other people. And a lot of those places, you know, they don't have as much, um, that, you know, they haven't heard about Jesus. They haven't heard about the gospel before. Mm -hmm. And so it's helping, you know, I see myself as training future missionaries, um, is my role as a missionary while equipping the church here to serve. So, and, and there's, how to, how am I going to ask this question? Like you have a role as a medical doctor that could be, um, you could go work for a nonprofit, right. That was trying to serve Mm -hmm. in a hospital Mm -hmm. because they needed doctors. Right. And then there's layered onto that or, 
um, enmeshed mm-hmm. within it is this commitment to um, sharing something of faith, of spirituality, about Jesus. And I'm curious how yeah, yeah. those things interact. Like, is that a um, kind of preach the gospel, use words if necessary? Like, I'm doing this through my actions mm-hmm. and um, training of people and giving hope. And mm-hmm. Or is it um, a more direct, like experience for you does that make sense that question yeah yeah i would say it's it i mean it's a pretty direct experience i mean my for me personally i um had like when i am seeing patients myself um my language skills aren't really good enough for me to try to like share the four spiritual laws with them yeah or you know try to lead them to a relationship with christ <laughs> yeah um if that make you know kind of thing um so that's and that's just not my jam and um not what i'm good at and there's we work in a mission hospital and it's still run by the church and so they have chaplains um you know uh, preaching in the waiting area. There's no, you know, there's not like pressure in this, uh, you know, the area where we are is, has a lot of Christian influence anyway. A lot of people would identify themselves as Christian who mm-hmm. come to the hospital. Um, you know, so a lot of them are just going around praying with patients, encouraging them. Um, and, you know, for me, the missionary role is, is more about trying to help people um, who have probably, uh, you know, most of the people that I'm teaching and training, they've been in church all their lives. Um, some of them may have had, you know, you know, op- opportunities for leadership in, you know, Christian union at school or whatever. Um, but a lot of, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're growing in their faith and they want to, so I see a lot of what I do is sort of challenging them to, find ways to grow, to learn how to read the Bible, to learn how to apply spiritual lessons that they might've heard to the day-to-day practice. You know, what does it mean to be a Christian um, in a setting where, you know, there's not a lot of healthcare justice and you have to spend a lot of time telling patients, I'm sorry, we just, you know, we just can't give you the care that you need because either we don't have it here or it's too expensive Mm -hmm. or what have you, you know, how do you help people to die? Well, Um, how do you deal with, you know, difficult ethical issues like, um, you know, uh, families where someone has HIV positive and their partner is not? Mm -hmm. Um, How do you give hope to people when, you know, they're, they're struggling, they're poor, they're depressed? what does it mean to work for healthcare justice in a system that's broken? Right. Um, so that's, the, those are the kinds of things that we're, that I try to challenge them and engage with them on. And, you know, we're all learning together. Yeah. And I, one, I wanted to actually um, land in that place about the learning from each other in the sense that mm-hmm. I read an article that you shared with me from plow quarterly that you wrote about when it, mm-hmm. um, in terms of how an understanding or a, a new, I guess, understanding of African spirituality kind of broadly has affected your Mm -hmm. own understanding of yourself, of medicine, of what it means to care for one another in our environments. And I'd love to hear about um, that relationship. We've heard a little bit about what you kind of are able to bring into a system, but I'm also curious what you've received, like how your own understanding of spirituality uh, may have changed from being in a different context than the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it, it's been, it's really incredible here, I would say, because I spent my entire life up until this point, hearing about like, holism and holistic spirituality and holistic medical practice. And in the US, a lot of that feels like just kind of lip service, can, you know, sort of gets merged into corporate speak and whatnot. Uh, but here I feel like that it's a lot easier to practice holistically. Mm. People you almost always come to the hospital with their families, with somebody who cares about them, um, especially in the mental health clinic. Um, they're usually, you know, very often they're brought by a family member or if they're, you know, if the person's family has not taken care of them, their neighbor, um, 
you know, which is so, so totally different in, in the U S where, you know, people sort of get dragged in by the police um, or, you know, they're by themselves living on the streets. And um, you know, that's just not the paradigm here. The paradigm is that people take care of each other mm. uh, whenever possible, which is not to say, I, I mean, occasionally you get someone who's brought to us by the police. <laughs> uh, right. that, that not that it never happens too. yeah um <laughs> but yeah but but the paradigm is that you know families and communities care for each other um and and fill in the gaps and so when we're talking to people about making plans for someone's care we're always involving other people in their lives and so we that social aspect that community aspect is always there in a mission hospital obviously it's much easier to talk about spirituality um as part of people's healing um and so i've just been really um impressed by that sense of you know people working together um as a community um and it's it's i would say um it's changed my spirituality in that way and that i i realize now how um how important that aspect of, of healing and wholeness is. And um, it's, uh, you know, just challenged me to, to look for as many opportunities as I can to integrate that in, in my practice um, and to be relying myself um, on other people in my own spirituality and in my community. Um, You know, my, this is a kind of a almost entirely separate, um, but another just aspect of spirituality that I've seen is, <clears throat> uh, or a way that I have been humbled in my own spirituality um, is just that, <clears throat> you know, worshiping in little churches made of wood and bricks and uh, corrugated tin roof and whatnot um, with no, nothing fancy, um, just, really has allowed me to focus on, okay, what's at the heart of a, of a church service, you know, we're singing together, we're praying together. Usually the music is, um, I, I honestly prefer, I've come to prefer acapella singing in church. Um, cause the alternative usually is a keyboard attached to a speaker. That's too loud using a, one of those, you know, fake drum tracking yes. things that, you can, you, that your kids can, mess with on the keyboard uh-huh. um sometimes uh people will even um like play one of the pre um set songs on the keyboard and then yeah. the chords don't always match with what we're singing <laughs> oh, <no>. um and <laughs> you know in that in that moment when i'm you know just trying to listen for you know the voices of the people that i'm with and hear them over the keyboard um, you know, just, it helps you to focus on, okay, so what I, what I come here to church for is I come here to hear the voices of the people that I'm with. I come to hear the word preached as, as simply as possible. You know, I come to, uh, you know, take, uh, the body and blood of Jesus, um, in communion. And, you know, that's, that's, what's most important. Mm. I love just that in both of those instances, though, that sense of being um, not as individually uh, paying as much attention to you yourself as an individual as yourself in a community and in relationship to God, but also in that yeah. sense of, um, you know, the picture of like the neighbor coming with the person with mental illness to the hospital or just the picture of the person standing next to you and singing in either case, Mm -hmm. that sense of, um, I think often in an American context, even when we talk about holistic healing, we're usually talking Mm -hmm. about that within the individual mind, body, spirit, um, and not even including this sense of like community and society as an aspect of healing, uh, and what I heard you saying was uh, kind of all of the above um, and, and right, really yeah. with an emphasis on that relationship outside of yourself with other people and with God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, one of the other pieces I read that you had written for mere orthodoxy was one that uh, came out at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think over two mm-hmm. years ago and you were writing about, well, the place that I uh, really focused was your um 
writing about suffering. And I thought mm-hmm. before I, I have a quotation from what uh, you wrote, but before we get there, could you explain mm-hmm. the Baconian project? Um, because that's uh. a reference that's not going to make sense to a lot of people. So if you could explain that and then I'll, and then I'll quote you. Yeah. Um, so the Baconian project is based on, you know, Francis Bacon and his, one of his big ideas was, okay, God has given, you know, at the very beginning of the enlightenment and scientific revolution, God has given us science so that way we can relieve suffering. And, you know, on its face, this is a very good thing. And this is what, you know, I went to medical school for and um, spend most of my day trying to do, um, giving people better living through chemistry and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, But the problem is that that there's a lot of suffering in our lives that can't be relieved by science or technology. And there's some suffering in our lives that maybe science and technology could relieve. um, But in order to do so, um, it, it causes problems um, either, um, you know, ethical problems uh, like, you know, uh, using stem cells, uh, I mean, that's a more controversial one. A more obvious one is, uh, I think everyone can agree on, is like taking organs from prisoners right. um, that are being executed. And that's, that's not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, you know, using, uh, you know, altering their bodies um, in, you know, really dramatic ways, um, I, I think, uh, is another controversial one, but one that has a lot of uh, really bad effects. Um, Or even things like, you know, we wanted to relieve pain Mm -hmm. um, in America. And part of that desire got misused, abused um, by drug companies. And then we have this massive opioid epidemic that we're still living through, um, where people wanted to use, they wanted to relieve pain, they wanted to relieve suffering. Um, But because not all suffering can be relieved um, and not all means to relieve suffering should always be used. Mm -hmm. Um, It causes problems. And so the Baconian project just sort of refers to the idea that like anytime science and technology gives us the opportunity to relieve suffering, we should take advantage of it without consideration for those other things. And it's sort of a, you know, it's it's just kind of an an impulse that drives a lot of medical practice and research and stuff like that. Um, and sort of unchecked, it leads to many of the problems that I described. Yeah. So I'm just going to quote you for a minute. Thank you so much for that um, background. And so this is from the, um, article I mentioned in Mere Orthodoxy, the right science applied by the right people in the right systems will adequately Mm -hmm. relieve human suffering. Kind of another Mm -hmm. definition of the Baconian Mm -hmm. problem. Of course, this isn't how it works, you write. Having shaped our imaginations and narrowed the horizons of what we think is good, the Baconian Mm. project wreaks havoc in three different ways. Lashing out with violence against suffering that it cannot relieve, mocking suffering that may not be meaningless, and reshaping our understanding of how to deal with suffering. In all of these, it takes the human condition and its limits as bad things that we ought to use technology to break rather than wisdom to remain within. There's so much in what you wrote that is worth unpacking there. Um, But I will give you kind of a broad question is just that um, I think one of the things, having just written a book about healing that I have really wrestled with is how to um, place and like position suffering within a wider narrative of healing, particularly from a Christian perspective. The easy and wrong way to approach this is to say, if you have enough faith, you will be healed. If you see the right doctor, you will be healed. Like suffering will be alleviated, whether that I think in the Baconian project is through technology Um, as long as we keep working hard. And I think there's almost a like spiritual version of that, which says, Mm -hmm. if you pray hard enough, or if you have enough faith, or if you, right? Like, and in both cases, I think that's wrong. However, Mm -hmm. I also think that there are things that we can do and participate in that will relieve suffering. And and that's good too. Like, it's not as though we want suffering. Um, Right. 
But what you're saying is also like alleviating suffering at whatever the cost is, is also not good. So I, right. I guess, how do you think about the role of suffering, especially as when it comes to this question of meaning and purpose? Mm. Um, and and have you had any experiences that have changed or affected the way you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a... It's a tough thing. And that's one of the things that I really appreciated about your book is that it brought all, you know, it, it, it really showed all the different kinds of perspectives that we can have on suffering within the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because I, I don't, you know, there's not one simple answer, right? Like some suffering is inevitable and has to be endured and in that endurance we reach out in faith um, to god for his comfort and for his sustaining Mm -hmm. um and to other people and as we come together and mourn together we you know it, it that's part of being human um is is feeling those that sorrow together uh some suffering is um uh, given to us in order that we might grow. Um, you know, it's kind of the, the struggle that makes us, uh, stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, some of, you know, some suffering is, is bad and, you know, apparently meaningless and, and we fight it, you know, we have, we just have to rage against it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's why, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we push, our, you know, healthcare professionals, I say we, uh, you know, kind of push ourselves to find, you know, to study hard, to work hard, um, to put in those long hours, because, you know, we want to push back against suffering that's, that we can relieve, um, you know, and then some suffering is uh, inflicted, because people are, um, you know, on themselves or on others, because people are, you um, foolish, sinful, um, unjust, Mm. um, those kinds of things. Um, and that's, you know, that's also some, you know, but that, that one's, those kinds of suffering are a lot harder, um, to root out because they're not, it's not like you're just sort of battling against nature. You're battling against human beings and, uh, their own, uh, desires, um, and frailties. Yeah. And that what you were just saying at the end there in terms of that sense of like suffering that we inflict upon one another and sometimes upon ourselves, um, Mm -hmm. for sure. But it brings me to another essay you wrote for Plow about um, food insecurity. And um, you were just writing about the ways in which um, we need to care for one another. And again, I think an Mm -hmm. American individual perspective, um, although I think we've seen this more it with the pandemic over the past couple of years, still that sense of membership in one another and Mm. understanding, especially for um, people who are Christians, this analogy, although I sometimes wonder whether um, Paul did not mean it so much as an analogy as we take it to be the body of Christ. Like, I think there's more, Mm -hmm. I think we should be more literalistic about that than we are, honestly. (laughs) Um, Sure. But anyway, you were uh, you were just saying that if one part of the body is suffering from this is a quote too much obesity, mm-hmm. diabetes, and high blood pressure, should we not ensure those brothers and sisters are cared for as friends and neighbors and share our table with them? Um, and I'm just thinking back to what you were just saying about the suffering that we inflict upon ourselves and upon one another, and then on the flip side of that, the capacity we have to um, alleviate that suffering. Not through um, necessarily, maybe through some medical program, but maybe through um, a different social system. Um, And I'm thinking back again to even what you were saying in the beginning as far as your role in teaching about justice and what does it mean to work within a broken or an unjust system. And so I'm curious to hear what the relationship, I guess this is, I'm thinking about the relationship between that's that particular suffering that we inflict upon one another and Mm -hmm. healing. Um, And whether you have any thoughts on for, you know, 
the rest of us kind of out there seeing the problems in the world, seeing the injustices, whether that's in sure. a healthcare system or in a global food system or whatever it is. Um, right. What does it mean for us to be participants in healing instead of either ignoring the suffering or participants in, you know, perpetuating that? Right, right. Yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's a complex question because you have people, I think, on, on every side and part of the way that our systems work is that they hide the ways in which, you know, our consumption can hurt other people. Um, and it also makes it just about impo- like, like there's no, there's no pure way to live anymore. Um, you can't, anything you do just, uh, you know, you, you're perpetually making compromises. Um, and that's one, that's one thing I feel like living a life overseas has helped me realize is that, you know, even in, uh, you know, a, a career of vocation focused on, you know, helping the poor doing good, like I constantly have to make compromises that are difficult um, that I don't want to put in my newsletter that I send out to supporters and whatnot. Mm. Um, just cause it's, you know, it's, it's not pretty. Um, and so, you know, accepting that and, and working through that, um, helps me to see, okay, so like, just, I have to find the, you know, the things that I'm doing that are worthwhile that are helping others to be healthier um, and, you know, let, let, as long as, as that is active um, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm making an appropriate amount of sacrifice for them. Like that's, that's as far as I can go. Um, I, you know, there's no perfectly intersectional, whatever way to go about it. And so I think for people anywhere, I would say, okay, think about, is there, what, what is it in your life um, that you notice is, is a need around you, um, is a, a place where you can serve a way that you can live your life um, that helps others who are uh, more vulnerable than you, more, less fortunate than you, um, and, you know, there's lots of different ways to do that for lots of different people. And I think if everybody just said, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to find some group of vulnerable hurting people, and I am going to give and find a way to help them um, in, in relationship with them um, until it hurts me a little, um, I think... I think the world would be a better place. Um, I, th- I think it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Um, emphasis on the in relationship part, because that, that part is messy and difficult and complicates things. Um, but it also, I think, is ultimately more rewarding and meaningful in the long run because it allows you as the person who has, you know, most obviously most people, I think, listening to this podcast would have some degree of money, privilege, whatever, um, it, it lets, it gives you, um, the opportunity to be shaped by whatever it is that that you're trying to do to help others. Well, and that's where I'm going to circle back to you just saying like, until it hurts a little bit. So where's the, what's the, (laughs) like, why include that in the, uh, kind of prescription for what might be, you know, a, a way forward? Oh, well, weren't we just talking about how suffering is good sometimes? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, in order to, in order to be, um, you know, it, Jesus came and, and was with us and suffered among us and, and with us. And so I do think that is in some ways a, uh, a model for uh, a prescription for how we serve others um, especially if we're trying to do it with him, for him, in his name. Um, and I think in, some, in, in many ways, I think we, we would prefer 
giving and helping in ways that don't hurt at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, one of the mixed blessings of technology is that you can like abstract your way yourself away from suffering and try to help others in a way that doesn't involve you like getting involved in their lives or like being in relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just not, not the way that human beings are supposed to be. Um, You're making me think about yeah. how, so like on the one hand, I might say, instead of getting involved relationally, I'm going to give money. Mm-hmm. And that yeah, yeah. doesn't hurt, right? I mean, because that yeah, in yeah. some mm-hmm. ways it is that in relationship part that is right. where the risk of hurt and that hurt might mean mm-hmm. like I, I actually get hurt feelings, like there's a relational yeah. hurt that's happening here. But it also mm-hmm. might be hurt in the sense of like inconvenience, like it just yes. takes more time or it takes more um, energy, emotional energy. I don't mm-hmm. have that, you know, whatever. Yeah. But there's this irony that also in choosing to protect myself in this imagined scenario that we're talking through um, by just giving money and not being in relationship, mm-hmm. I am ultimately yeah. incurring a different hurt by being cut mm-hmm. off from whoever it is, you know, that I'm, that we're talking right. about here. And, and right. so, and that's not, that's almost a passive hurt and it's not necessarily mm-hmm. one that I'm going to know that I've inflicted, but, um, at, you know, as you know, and I've kind of written about like that sense of, um, cutting myself off, not even necessarily knowingly from people who are more vulnerable than I am because I've been born right. into a position where I can do that. I can, yeah. without even thinking about it, cut myself off from um, people who are um, more vulnerable and feel as though that is a positive form of self-protection. Certainly yeah. something that allows me to be more productive and efficient in my life. And yet yeah. when I was kind of thrust into a world through a child with a disability of greater vulnerability, um, there was, I think, more propensity for hurt on, of, a, of yeah. a certain type that came with it. And yeah. yet also this invitation. And essentially, this is where I think underneath both those words, the relationship and the love and the hurt is love. That if yeah. the if the motivating and animating factor is one of love, there will almost certainly be hurt incurred because of the brokenness of our world. And yeah. yet... That's also not where um, it, everything will be. Everything won't be defined by that hurt. It will be defined by that love. I think in mm-hmm. the end. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I and I think in many ways that sort of relationship, um, like the one you described in your family, is in. I I feel like in many ways is sort of paradigmatic for how. how um, you know, the, the, the closeness and the intimacy allow for, um, just this, uh, a deeper, um, uh, a, a way of helping that is just incommensurate with any other way of, of loving somebody, of giving to them, um, and also the, the reciprocal, like just the, you know, um, whatever, however you want to qualify or explain, you know, describe what you have received um, in that relationship that you may not have received in any other relationship mm-hmm. um, is just, yeah. Uh, well, I have one more question for you. I mean, I have plenty mm-hmm. more questions, but for the sake sure. of uh, time, yours and our mm-hmm. listeners, um, I am, I'm curious about the role of medicine in healing. Like that, I, uh-huh. I think you've written really compellingly about the limits of medicine. Uh-huh. And yet, um, I also think that there is kind of a, a proper place. And, uh, one of the things, again, when I was writing this book that I had to be kind of reminded of again and again by readers was like, but there uh-huh. is a place for medicine. Like we are really <laughs> grateful for antibiotics. Like, um, there's a goodness here and let's not, you know, let's yeah. not, um, 
deny that. And, and I'm just curious, mm-hmm. like, how you think about, or if you have a way of thinking about, like, the proper role. Of, oh, this is a quote from you. Um, the more we get used to submitting our problems to medicine, the more medicine looms large in our minds as the solution to everything. So that's like identifying a problem mm-hmm. with medicine. Like, it's not the solution right. to everything. And I think that's what I was, one of the things I was trying to do in the yes. book was to say, like, if we think that we just need to go to a doctor doctor in order to get fixed, we're going to like miss so much of the healing that's available to us oh, yeah. in non-medical ways. And yet there is a place for, there's a proper role of medicine. And I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about like, what is medicine for? Like, wh- and what's, what's the goodness in that? Um, since we have, I think named some of the problems with it. Yeah, no. And that was, um, I mean, I know we're uh, it, again to, to just, say your book I, that was one of the things I really appreciated about your book is that that perspective of okay there are you know there's only so much that medicine can do um because I think there there is just this push um to say okay well you know you just need you know the uh, the medical system should be uh, should be able to fix these things. Right. Um, and it, it just doesn't, can't, um, you know, you know, you see that you know, this push now, okay, everybody needs to go to therapy or what have you. And right. um, ask any therapist, <laughs> they spend a lot of their time working with people who are not helped by <laughs> their work. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, what, um, I think what, what medicine is for, is, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, have with a a specific set of problems, it is able to do everything from, you know, completely reverse Mm -hmm. um, certain problems to um, providing people with suggestions, um, ideas, possibilities, Mm-hmm. for um, a small amount of comfort uh, along the journey of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's sometimes hard to know which is which. Um, so it's always, I feel like medicine is kind of like a place to start um, if you have a problem with your body. Um, but just you know, because, you know, you do want to talk to somebody to check and make sure, okay, is this one of those things that can actually be fixed 100% um, by a surgery or a medicine or what have you? Um, but, you know, there's some things that obviously it, it is terrible at fixing, makes it, you know, makes things worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and other things that, you know, it's, it's limited in its, in its scope. Medicine is for um, helping us to live in our bodies um, in a way that is more conducive with our flourishing. Oh man, I use the F word. Um, <laughs> I think it's the first time. That's all right. <laughs> we can have one okay. flourishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here at the end. Here at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just. Yeah. It's, it's help. It's. It's. You know, I, I think a lot about Gilbert Melander. He talks about the arc of life mm-hmm. and how everybody has this arc of life that starts off, you know, in complete dependence and ends in complete dependence and death. Um, and everybody has a differently shaped arc. Mm-hmm. And medicine is, I feel like, mostly about helping people have smoother arcs one way or the other. You know, it's, it's keeping you from like totally falling off. Um, you know, due to some accident or, you know, severe sudden illness, um, you know, but it's also helping people, you know, meet death in a way that is um, uh, conducive with light. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> words are sort of disappearing. This no, is, but I'm thinking about um, but, like, but helping people to meet death in, in an appropriate way. And like medicine in a, as in a, a good way, in the best way possible. Right. I'm thinking about medicine as a servant of some larger mm-hmm. purposes of human life. 
um, and a few yeah. minutes flourishing um, to use that. But yes. but truly, as opposed to there be as, as opposed to it being a solution to problems, like it can solve problems, yeah. and yet um, mm-hmm. at the same time, that sense of being able the freedom that can come from putting limits on what medicine can do in terms of saying yeah. there's a lot more. Um, and, and one of the, right. one of the things I've also been really struck by is the way in which medicine can be a really helpful interruption to pain. Mm-hmm. Um, but not, often not a long-term solution to pain where it can say, yeah. okay, um, medicine, you know, my friends who've gone on antidepressants, which has just stopped a cycle of thinking or believing that has allowed them to do some work on a more emotional and, you know, spiritual level. Right. Yeah. To the point Mm -hmm. where the antidepressants might continue to be in their life. They might not, but they were the interruption. They Mm -hmm. weren't the solution. It was the other work that was the solution. And I think that can be true even with, um, physical pain as well, where, you know, my friend who just had ACL surgery, she needs painkillers in part so that she can start doing the actual physical work to restore her knee, um, and not just to mm-hmm. take the pain away. Um, anyway, I, I just appreciate your, um, as someone who's very much within the field of believing that like there's a place for medicine and for hospitals and for doctors. And yet um, also saying that we really, there's an imp- a real deep importance to understanding the limits um, within the context of what it means um, to bring a broader and deeper healing into the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that, that phrase of it's, it's a servant to other things mm-hmm. in our life. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 a uh, it's a way of, of, you know, in, uh, keeping some, you know, keeping certain aspects of our, you know, pain or disability from, uh, completely crushing us. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, allowing us to do all the other things that are good in life. Mm. Well, I hope you do write that book someday and we'll make sure to have you back on the podcast if you do. And, um, thank you for your time and just for the, uh, service that you're offering both in your like day to day context, but also in sharing some of these thoughts with us here. And I'll make sure in the show notes to also just link to the different, um, essays that I've read and appreciated, um, and that we've gotten to talk about here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been a great conversation. I wish I could have 45 minutes to ask you questions. Oh, well, someday. (laughs) Someday. Thanks, as always, for listening to this episode of Love is Stronger Than Fear. I do highly recommend Matthew's essays, which we will link to in the show notes. And he has, it happens, I didn't know this until we talked, but has a review of my new book, To Be Made Well, um, in Mere Orthodoxy. And I will link to that review in the show notes as well. I'm always grateful to Jake Hansen for editing this podcast and to Amber Beery, my social media coordinator, for all of her support and help in making this uh, come out into the world. And finally, I am thankful for you. And as you go into your day today, I hope you will carry with you the peace that comes from believing that love is stronger than fear. <laughs>